Good morning, and before we move to business today, I would like to say a few words to the Chamber. Members will wish to know that I have this morning written to Speaker Berko, Lord Fowler, and to the Mayor of London on behalf of the Scottish Parliament. I wanted to convey our sympathy and our sorrow, sorrow our solidarity with fellow parliamentarians and to express our sense of loss at the loss of life and cruel suffering inflicted on so many innocent individuals and their families yesterday. Flags are flying at half-mast at Holyrood today, and we observed a one-minute silence this morning as a mark of respect to those affected by the tragic events. This morning, the Parliament's corporate body received a briefing from Police Scotland. I want to reassure members that there is no change to the threat level, no intelligence to suggest a specific threat to Scotland, Edinburgh or Holyrood. However, as a precautionary measure, security was heightened with immediate effect at the Scottish Parliament and the, Scottish, the corporate body in discussion with Police Scotland and the security services will continue to keep our security arrangements under review as we always do. I convened a meeting of the Parliamentary Bureau this morning and a motion will be put to Parliament later today proposing that the debate on Scotland's choice be rescheduled for next Tuesday. This change has the support of all business managers. Other business today will proceed as scheduled as will the business at our sister Parliament in Westminster. And I hope I speak for all members in saying that this shocking event should serve to remind us of the importance of holding firm to our humanity and of defending our democracy. Thank you. We move now to general questions. Oh, sorry, beg pardon. The first item of business, I beg your pardon, is a consideration of business motion 4845 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme for today. Can I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak buttons? I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. I therefore put the question. The question is that we agree motion 4845 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. We move now to general questions and we start with question number one from John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle violence against women and prostitution. Minister Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I would wish to associate myself and my colleagues with your remarks uh, this morning. To respond to Mr Mason's question, the Scottish Government is committed to tackling all forms of violence against women and girls, including women in prostitution. The Scottish Government supports a range of measures that can help reduce the harm caused by prostitution and encourages the enforcement of existing laws against those who seek to exploit others through prostitution. The question of how to deal with prostitution in the longer term and whether any specific approach can or does reduce the inherent harm associated with it is very complex and policy decisions should be evidence-based. That is why we commissioned research in 2015 to consider the reliability of the evidence based internationally on the impacts of the criminalisation of the purchase of sex and research which explored the available knowledge and evidence of prostitution in Scotland. This research, presiding officer, was published by the Scottish Government on 24 February of this year to help further inform the debate. We look forward to hearing views on the findings of the research around what is a highly complex and contested area. John Mason. I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, I mean, I've, I've now heard a number of survivors of prostitution speaking about their experiences, and I have to say it's been very moving, not least uh, last Saturday at the, last Friday at the SNP conference. Um, even survivors who were working in a brothel in Edinburgh, which was tacitly approved, were, continued to be abused uh, by pimps and others. Uh, will the Minister agree to meet some of the survivors of prostitution and hear their experiences? Minister. Uh, I, I thank the, the member for his supplementary question and I do think it is important indeed that we listen to, to the views of everybody uh, uh, involved, including the views of uh, sex workers both from both sides of the debate, those in favour of criminalisation uh, and those opposed. And therefore I can say to the member I would be happy to meet uh, with former and current sex workers to listen to their views uh, on the findings of the research and to listen to their experiences in order to help inform future policy considerations. Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also welcome the policy decision on commercial sexual exploitation taken by the SNP conference at the weekend, which is very similar to the stance of the Scottish Labour Party. 
Both policy positions are in line with equally safe, the Scottish Government's violence against women strategy endorsed by this Parliament. But we need to take action now to stop this exploitation happening. I'm glad that the Minister has accepted to meet with survivors to learn about the devastating effects that that has had on them. I had asked the First Minister and indeed the Cabinet Secretary to do this some time ago. Will that meeting now take place and will they put a plan of action in place that will deal with commercial sexual exploitation and promote equality? Minister. I, I recognise Rhoda Grant's long-standing uh, interest uh, in the subject and I would say to the member uh, that work has been ongoing on this matter for some time uh, and I would advise that the immediate next steps that we plan to take are to allow all interested stakeholders, including uh, current sex workers and those who have exited prostitution, to digest the detailed research that we did publish on the uh, 24th of February, just uh, about four weeks ago. We then plan uh, uh, to engage further with these stakeholders to obtain their views on that published research. And I can say to, to Rhoda Grant that I have asked uh, officials to hold meetings after the Easter recess uh, with key stakeholders uh, and to see, uh, to, uh, to try to understand uh, what their current views are and if their views have changed at all further to the uh, published research. In terms of the uh, meetings that I'm happy to have with uh, uh, current uh, and uh, former sex workers, I will ensure that officials put those uh, in place uh, in the weeks to come. Question two has not been lodged. Question number three, Anasawa. To ask the Scottish Government whether it plans to reopen the York Hill Minor Injuries Unit and if so, on what date it will do so. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. The planning and provision of local services is the responsibility of NHS boards and integrated partnerships in line with national policies and frameworks. NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has confirmed that the closure of the minor injuries unit at York Hill is a temporary measure to ensure that a, there is a robust unscheduled care cover across the city. After a meeting of the Acute Services Committee this week, the board will be carrying out a review to determine the best location for a replacement service for the west of Glasgow to best meet the needs of local people. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The minor injury unit closed two days before Christmas and with no notice to local people except a sign at the entrance. At that time, the local public were reassured that this was just a temporary measure to cover the peak during winter. That was confirmed by the First Minister at First Minister's questions. But as of today, the minor injury unit has still not reopened. And I now have a letter from the Chief Executive of the Health Board who states that due to the continued pressures at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, this minor injury unit service will remain closed and also during the review period, a review into whether we should have a minor injury unit service at York Hill at all, that the service will remain closed as well. Again, this has been done with no consultation with the public. There has been no information at all to the public, no consultation, no going through of due process of service reform. This simply isn't acceptable, is it, Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet Secretary. So uh, let me reiterate what I said in my answer, what I hope Anna Sawar was listening to, that uh, indeed this is a, a temporary measure and yes it has been taken to uh, help to uh, provide uh, unscheduled care cover across the city. However, as I said to him in my initial answer, the Acute Services Committee this week uh, has uh, agreed to review uh, where the best location in the west of Glasgow should be for a minor injury service because as Anna Sarwar should know if he paid attention to the detail, the York Hill unit was always an interim step as part of the migration of services in Glasgow in recent years and it may be that there is a better permanent location for a minor injuries unit that would better serve the people of the west of Glasgow. I would have thought that Anna Sarwar would agree that it is that that piece of work should uh, go. And of course, in terms of consultation with local people, it should be uh, that Greater Glasgow and Clyde should be discussing with local people where the best location in the west of Glasgow uh, should be. And I would certainly be encouraging them to do so. Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned a review that was being carried out. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde looking at this review, are looking at other sites uh, such as Gap Naval as well as York Hill for minor injury unit in the west of the city. 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, and considering where the West of Glasgow service should be provided, the Board will need to go through a process to identify the most appropriate location for this service, which will look at both Gart Naval and York Hill to assess which would meet the, the best meet the needs of, of local people. I have asked that the Board to keep the member informed on timing and process, and I would certainly encourage her uh, to engage further with the Board on this and indeed to uh, ensure that uh, the, the views of local people that Sandra White represents are uh, conveyed to the Board in terms of what that best location should be. Annie Wells. Thank you, President Officer. There have been reports that York Hill closure was due to staff shortages, staff shortages over Christmas. Between December 2011 and December 2016, nursing and midwifery vacancies in Glasgow rose from 0.3% to 3.4%, which equates to 541 vacant posts. What will the Cabinet Secretary do to ensure that there are enough nurses in Glasgow to provide urgent care? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I can say to the member that in terms of the workforce growth uh, over the last 10 years, qualified nurses and midwives in Glasgow are up 5.5% uh, .5 or 597 whole-time uh, equivalent. Uh, however, uh, what I would also say to the member is that clearly demand has also increased. So it's very important that in terms of how services are delivered, they're delivered in, a, in the best way to meet not just the current demands, but the future demands as well. And if we look at the demands on unscheduled care, those have grown not just in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but across the rest of Scotland as well. So it's very important that services continue uh, to meet those demands, which is why in terms of the west of the, of the city, it is very important that in terms of that minor injury service and potentially services that would go around that could provide a very important part of that unscheduled care service and I hope that's something the member would support and again if she wants to uh, um, meet with the board to discuss uh, this in more detail then I'm sure they would be willing to do that. Question number four, Graeme Simpson. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the comments by the Divisional Commander of British Transport Police in Scotland that its proposed merger with Police Scotland risks reducing the effectiveness of railway policing. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, Police Scotland has confirmed to the Scottish Parliament that its intention would be to maintain a specialist railway policing function within the broader Police Scotland structure. This will retain the skills, knowledge and experience that BTP officers and staff have built and embed railway policing within the wider local, specialist and national resource of Police Scotland. Graeme Simpson. The Justice Committee has heard that up to 40% of British transport police officers could leave the surface if this merger goes ahead. A huge concern to operators like Virgin and Cross Country and indeed all of us. British Transport Police Federation Chairman Nigel Goodband told their conference in Cardiff yesterday the plans are driven by nationalistic jingoism and amount to a childish wish from the SNP to play with their own train set, not based on any evidence. Expert after expert says the BTP isn't broken, and Chief Superintendent John McBride, who I referred to in my question, told MSPs that when other police are involved in rail incidents, it takes 50% longer to investigate and get trains moving again. So does the Minister dismiss the, the views of Mr McBride and others, or is he going to listen? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, we have uh, engaged extensively with uh, uh, the British, police, uh, uh, British Transport Police Federation and with the others within uh, railway policing on a whole variety of issues relating to the intention to integrate uh, railway policing in Scotland into uh, Police Scotland. As I mentioned earlier on to uh, the member, uh, Police Scotland have been very clear about their intention on, on maintaining a specialist railway uh, policing function within uh, Police Scotland and to do so under a single strategic command structure, which will allow us to make sure that we maintain that specialist resource, making sure that the railway uh, services and that passengers receive the quality of service which they require and that they believe is necessary but at the same time also increasing their capacity to be able to draw upon national resource, specialist resource, in a way which they are not able to do to the same extent at the present moment. In addition to that, in order to provide reassurance to the staff within BTP, 
Uh, we have made it very clear to uh, the British Transport Police Federation and to the staff unions uh, that we have offered a triple lock, which guarantees uh, security of job, uh, security of pay and security of their pension uh, continue, uh, conditions. And we will continue to work with them as we take this legislation forward within the Scottish Parliament to provide them with the reassurance that they require and also the assurance that the public require about the way in which specialist railway policing will continue to be delivered if Parliament supports our legislation. Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Assistant Chief Constable Bernard Higgins of Police Scotland and Chief Constable Crowther of British Transport Police both told the Justice Committee that Police Scotland do indeed have the specialisms and resources it needs to take over policing of railways in Scotland. Does the Minister agree and would you like to reiterate your earlier comments? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Assistant Chief Constable uh, Higgins in his evidence to the uh, Justice Committee was very clear about the ability of Police Scotland to be able to deliver specialist uh, policing in a range of areas. Uh, for example, we already have specialist uh, police delivery uh, a, a specialist functions at the present time, whether it be airports or ports, whether it be uh, in, uh, uh, underwater uh, or whether it be in other areas such as uh, firearms. And there is no doubt that the uh, assurances which uh, ACC Higgins has provided has demonstrated uh, a commitment to making sure that we maintain the specialist function of railway policing uh, due to integration uh, of uh, BTP into Police Scotland that be agreed by this Parliament. Neil Bibby. Uh, President officer, I know whatever differences we have in the chamber, I know we all want to pay tribute to the work of all our brave police officers, wherever they are, and our thoughts will be with PC Keith Palmer. Uh, major rail unions have warned that they are prepared to consider industrial action if the Scottish Government uh, pushes ahead with the railway policing bill and the breakup of the British Transport Police. Is the Justice Secretary pre prepared to risk yet more disruption on Scotland's railways for a merger that workers do not want, that the public do not need, and those who actually represent British Transport Police officers have said is supported by no logic, no reason and no evidence. Cabinet Secretary. Well, what I can assure the member of is that uh, both myself and my colleague Hamza Yusuf will continue to engage with the variety of stakeholders who have an interest in how policing is delivered on our railways, including uh, the unions, and to provide them with the assurance that they are looking for around how uh, policing will be delivered should integration be agreed by this Parliament and to provide them with the assurance that they will continue to receive the level of service that they expect and is provided at the present moment. Uh, and ultimately, President Officer, it will be for this Parliament to decide upon whether integration takes place or not by whether choosing to approve our legislation or not. It will be for the Labour Party to set out their position on that matter, but ultimately it will be for Parliament to decide on whether integration takes place or not. Question number five, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its timetable is for proceeding with the results of the consultation on increasing the number of organ donations. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. The independent analysis of the consultation on increasing the number of organ and tissue donations will be submitted to the Scottish Government in May this year. A decision informed by the outcome of the consultation will be made shortly after that. Mark Griffin. I welcome the Minister's previous comments that there is a presumption in favour of a move to an opt-out system of organ donation. But given that is the case, does the Minister agree that there would need to be a major public awareness and education campaign around an opt-out system, that there would understandably be a long lead-in time before that system was up and running and saving lives, and so swift action is essential as a result? Minister. Um, I um, take on board the, the comments that the, the member raises and absolutely the, the crucial thing about making sure this is right is to take the time to properly consider the consultation responses. There have been 836 consultation responses to uh, this uh, consultation. Uh, we have also alongside the work on the soft opt-out, which we did set out our pre uh, presumption for a soft opt-out in the consultation, there has been a significant amount of work to increase the rate of donors. We have the, some of the highest uh, rate of donors per million of population than any other part of the UK. We've got the highest ever number of de deceased donors this financial year. So alongside the work that we're doing, the careful work that needs to be taken uh, forward uh, relating to this uh, exercise, the soft opt-out, we have also got alongside that significant work that's ongoing to increase the rate of donors to make sure that we have this uh, proceeded with the sensitivity that it requires and we'll take the time to go through the consultation 
uh, responses and make sure that we keep the member and the rest of the Parliament updated on the progress on the uh, legislation. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister please advise as to how many people are currently awaiting a transplant in Scotland and how many people died whilst waiting for a transplant in the last year for which figures were available? Minister. I can get back to the member on some of the, uh, the detail that he seeks. However, the active transplant waiting list has decreased by 20%. We've also got, uh, uh, since 2008, the number of donors in Scotland has increased by 131% as well. And moreover, in response to the, questions that the, the, the question that Mark Griffin, we do have the highest rate of donors per million of population than in any other country in the UK. So alongside the work, the careful work we're having to take on the uh, uh, opt-out, uh, the soft opt-out, the presumption of the soft opt-out for the legislation that we uh, consulted on, we also have a significant number of uh, other areas of work that taking forward to ensure that people get uh, uh, transplant, uh, transplants when they need it and that we increase the number of donors